Amen. It is so good to see all of you this morning. My name is Pastor Elliot. My wife Tiffany and I have the great privilege of pastoring this group of people called Lifeline Church. Come on, clap your hands if you're happy to be in the house of the Lord today. Come on, it is a good day. Welcome to part one of our new series called How to Live Through a Bad Day. And let me just tell you, it is exactly what it sounds like. That's what it's about, all right? There's no guesswork on this title, How to Live Through a Bad Day. Day. This is actually um, a perfect series. If you were thinking about inviting your friends or your family, maybe um, your friends and family who haven't been to church in a long time or maybe they've never been to church, this series is perfect for them because it's very practical and it meets people in their, their most immediate need. So I want to invite you to do what I can't do and invite your own coworker, invite your own friend, invite your own family member. There is something about this season, y'all, with Easter right around the corner. People like to get saved right around Easter time, and it's a beautiful thing. I love it. I don't care if people call them CEOs, Christmas and Easter only. Well, give me a crack at them on Easter, and we'll see what, what the Lord has to say about that as God speaks into, into things. It's going to be a great day. Easter is coming, and we are doing our third annual Easter egg hunt at Hutchin Street Square. It is going to be off the hook. It's going to be so amazing. Last year, 10,000 eggs and 1,000 people. That was pretty good. Yeah, they're like golf clapping. Yeah, that was all right. I mean, it's like, it's good. But this year, we're looking to have 15,000 eggs and 1,500 people. It is going to be absolutely amazing. And we've got prizes, yo, because it's not a really family-friendly event unless there's free prizes. First of all, unless it's free. Second of all, there's a prize, okay? And so there's, there's little eggs hidden in there. They're golden eggs. And what you do with your kids, you know, zero to 12, this event is for you know, the whole family there. You can take that little golden egg and go back to our Lifeline booth and say, I want to redeem this egg for a prize. And we've made it available for y'all to be a part of that. Maybe you can serve that day. That's the Saturday before Easter from 10 to 12. It's going to be amazing. We would love to have you there helping with that event. Before we showed up, it was uh, about seven senior citizens that made up the senior citizen group with the Hutchins Street Square, and then we came in with like 60 volunteers. They're like, uh, do you mind if we do it a little more? <laughs> do you mind if we do this event like go big or go home? Sure, you can. And so there's a, a chance for you to be involved with this by, by going to the Life Center back there, and we've got these little cards that have different number amounts on there. Each prize is worth a different amount. It's an opportunity for you to give a prize to one of these kids in the community where, you know, we don't know if some of these families – they weren't going to do anything for Easter. You know, like literally eggs. Like here, have an egg because we just don't have the money or whatever. But this is a free event where you can provide a, an awesome gift. Some people in first service, they, I think all the bikes already got taken. But hey, let, there's one more. There's another bike. Like a bike? Come on, somebody. If the church puts on an event in the city, I don't want to do it unless we're going to bless their socks off. So get back there after the service, after the service and let's, let's bless our community and do that. And one of the best I would think it's the best gift that we're going to give away that day is if, if you come to that event, so if you invite your friends and family to this event, we're going to give them a little raffle ticket, and if they come to church the next day, they could win four passes to Disneyland. What? Dude, that's crazy. That's going to be so much fun. But somebody said, well, you need to do that to bring people to church. Well, I don't need to do it to bring people to church, but if four passes to Disneyland gets a family saved and they go to heaven instead of hell, yeah, it's worth it. Yeah, we're going to go ahead and do that. Easter's going to be an amazing day. And one more thing about that. We decided, man, because we got this raffle. You know, we want everybody to be in one space at one time. And last year, if you were here a year ago, raise your hand if you were with the church about a year ago. Most of you, a lot of you, not everybody. That's fantastic. We love to see all of our new friends and family here. But last year, we, we did a little thing called Room for More. And we, we went to two services, and the dream team said, but I already worked so hard for one service. And we went to two services, made Room for More, and we were growing and growing and growing. But this year, we got a, another clever idea. What if we cut these steps out right here? What if we put three more rows out the front? What if we put two more rows out the back? What if we widen these out? What if we could fit, like, all 250 people in one service? You think we should? Yeah, I think we should too. 10 o'clock starting on Easter, and that's the way it's going to be until we go to two services again, but it'll be after we have like more than 350 people. So just don't hold your breath. Let me just say that. It's coming. It's coming. But starting on Easter, mark your calendars, mark your phones, mark a reminder, 10 a.m. is the new service time starting on Easter. It's going to be an amazing day. I'm so excited for it, but raise your hand at me if you've ever had a bad day. Go ahead. Show of hands if anybody in here has ever had a bad day. So like most of you, the rest of you. I want to service because I don't know what your deal is, but yeah, I've had a bad day too. My bad day started in rehab 
Okay, my, my bad day is already worse than your bad day. Don't even trip. I was in rehab. This was about 13 years ago. And I was in a little program called the Salvation Army over there in Stockton. And I was a beneficiary in that program. And I had to work to, for my keep to stay in that program. It was the beginning of a bad day when I was out on a truck. And we had to go to the deep south of Stockton to, to the nice neighborhood, this little trailer park. I forget the name of it. And we were going to pick up all the donations they had at that trailer park. So we pull in there. And the first thing we see out front of somebody's house is, is, this, is this couch, right, this couch. And so we walk up to the couch, and I walk up there. And you ever just walk up to a couch and just, whew, this couch got pee-peed on. I can smell it from here. I walk up. I'm like, I don't know how many beasts have peed on this couch or how long this couch has been outside, but this is a pee-pee couch. This is forever known, and I will always remember this couch as the pee-pee couch. But, you know, I didn't own a thrift store back then. For, for those of you who don't know, we do have a thrift store, Lifeline Thrift, where we do a food bank and we give away clothes and we try and make money so that we can start a recovery center. Long story short, I didn't own a thrift store back then. I was in rehab, okay, and I was nicer back then, way nicer back then. So I go up to the couch. I'm like, oh, come on. Let's help them out. Let's help them out. They just want to donate. No, they don't want to just donate. They didn't want to donate. They want us to throw away their garbage is what they wanted. But we go up to the couch, and I was much nicer and kinder back then. So I'm like, come on, man. Let's just pick it up. The truck driver's like, all right, fine. If you want to, we'll do it. We pick up the couch, put it in. And even though I was in rehab, I was a little bossy back then. I just got to be honest with you. You know, this is a place of truth and honesty. So I'm just trying to be honest. I was a little bossy. And so I was telling my, the employee, he worked for the Salvation Army. I'm in rehab with the Salvation Army. I'm telling him, hey, you know, I'm, I'm giving orders. You know, you, you tie up the couch, and I'm going to go over here and get some more bags. I'll come back. Because there's a lot of stops in that trailer park that we had to get to. And so he's doing his thing, whatever he was doing in the truck, not tying up the couch. And I was over here getting more bags, throwing them in. And I sat on the back of the, the truck, and I'm thinking, all right, let's go to the next stop. And we're going over here. And we go over an undulation. But, you know, in that part of, of the neighborhood, they call them speed humps. But in the nice part of the neighborhood, they call them undulations. So I'm going to call them undulations for our sake here. And we go over a speed hump, and my spidey scent starts tingling right back here. And I look out the corner of my eye, and I see pee, -pee couch coming right at my face. Here comes pee, pee couch trying to ruin my day. So I jump off the seat of my pants. Yeah, it's a true story. I jump off the seat of my pants, and I throw myself. I'm trying to get some leverage. And the only thing pee, -pee couch gets a chance to do is touch this one little finger right there. Everybody see that? Okay, can you see that all the way in the back? Okay, it touches this little finger right here. Smushed my little ring finger to smithereens. Just squished it right out. Okay, and it's like I had a little piece of shredded beef. It just went whomp and fell down just like that. But you know, if you've ever like seen the inside of your finger before, there's a nerve that goes all the way up in there. It's like about the texture of a um, wet noodle, and it's real rubbery. And so it doesn't, it doesn't sever like skin and like flesh does, it likes to hold on. And so it held on. That, that's the thing that feels pain, by the way. That's what my finger's hanging on by. And so it's not off yet. It's like, seriously, you could take toenail clippers and just cut it off. It'd be done. Doesn't that make you hurt just thinking about it? It does. It, me, me too. Me too. My bad day's not over. I go to the emergency room, Sam McKean General, bless their hearts. And they look right at me and they say, oh, son, we're going to take care of you. I was... 21 at the time. We're going to take care of you, son. Let me just go ahead and see your insurance card. Insurance? I'm in rehab, y'all. And they said, mm, is that right? They propped my finger back up, put a bandage around it, and said, well, you're good to go. I'm like, what you talking about? This is rotting flesh on the end of my fingertip. They said, well, it's not life-threatening. So come back when you have some insurance, and we'll take care of you. <laughs> I'm like, ah. I'm in rehab, by the way, which means no pain meds. Tylenol. Tyler, I go back to the Salvation Army, more bad news. Salvation Army says, you know, we feel really bad that you got hurt, you know, on the job and everything. But we have a policy here, and if you are not fit for work, you can't be in this program. You can either leave and, and go to prison for like five years, eight months, or you can stay when, you know, I was at work the next day with a rotting piece of flesh on the end of my finger. Come on, wave all five fingers at me if you've ever had a bad day. Come on. If you had a bad day like me once, we had a I, I had a bad. It was just a bad day. It was just a bad day. But, you know, the Bible has a lot to say about living through a bad day. Living through a bad day. It says this in Hebrews 12. Listen to this. Keep your eyes on Jesus, who both began and finished this race we're in. Listen to this, my favorite part. Study how he did it. Study how he lived through his bad day. Study how he did it. 
because he never lost sight of where he was headed. That exhilarating finish in and with God. He could put up with anything. How many of you want that in your life? Be able to put up with anything. Some of you all feel like you're trying to put up with anything, but not like Jesus. He could put up with anything along the way, the cross, the shame, whatever. And now he's there in the place of honor alongside God. You want to know the funny thing about Easter time and, and the Friday before that? You know what we call it? The Friday before Easter. Anybody know what it's called? Good Friday was actually Jesus' worst day on earth. His worst day. We call it Good Friday, ironically. But it was his worst day. And I, I, I would say it's the worst day that anybody's ever lived in all of creation. I, I would argue that. I would say that. But listen to this. this. This whole series, How to Live Through a Bad Day, is actually a book that Jack Hayford wrote. It's just a little tiny book. You go on Amazon and get it for like 12 bucks. It's a tiny little book. And it's based on the seven statements that Jesus said on the cross. Jesus said seven things when he was on that cross. And that teaches us, study how he did it, how to live through a bad day. And listen to, to, to the first, not just the only thing, this is the first thing he said. We find it in the Gospel of Luke. He says this, Father... Forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. Father, up on the cross, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. Now, I don't know about you, but if I was Jesus and I had all the power of Jesus and they put me up on that cross, you know what I'd say? You dead, you dead, you dead, you dead, y'all dead, and y'all see you in hit. No, I wouldn't say any of that. No, Jesus wouldn't say that. He said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. And not only was it just one of the things, no, it was the first thing that he said. That's why I believe it's the first thing we need to understand when we want to learn how to live through a bad day. Lesson number one. Go ahead and write this in your notes if you've got a pencil. Saved people take notes. No, I'm just kidding. Go ahead. But if you've got a pen, write this in. We've got blanks for you. It goes like this. Lesson number one. Forgive everyone who's trying to ruin your life. <laughs> Forgive everyone who's trying to ruin your life because we all got somebody who trying, and they ain't sitting next to you either, okay? Let me just go ahead and nip that in the bud right there. That's not them. But we all got somebody, it's, the, it's their purpose in life. It is their purpose, their plan. Listen, they went through our growth track. They went through step two. They took their spiritual gifts tests. They took their personality profile. The results are in. Their spiritual gift is to wreck your day. Their spiritual gift is to make you mad at work. Their spiritual gift is to offend you and cause you to just have a horrible day. It's going to happen. It's absolutely going to happen. And somebody in church said, Pastor, could you please be a little more positive? We're in church here. Okay. I'm positive. Someone is going to mess your day up. Someone is going to come at you sideways. Someone's going to look at you the wrong way, say something the wrong way. It's going to happen. Let's go to the Word to, to learn more about that. Matthew 24. And then many will be offended, will betray one another, and will hate one another. Yikes. Luke 17, he said to his disciple, it is impossible that no offense should come. It is it's going to happen. You will be offended. It's going to happen. But you know what a lot of us like to do? When, when offense comes our way, when, when someone does us wrong, someone does us dirty, we're like, oh, man, you said that to me, you did that to me, oh, I'm going to show you. I'm going to sit over here, and I'm going to have a horrible life and be miserable. Yeah, that'll show them. And we are over here suffering and sulking and hurting. Meanwhile, they don't even know what's going on. They don't even know they offended you. Has this ever happened to anyone but me? Someone makes me mad, says something weird to me, and I'm mad about it for like six months. Come on, somebody, don't leave me alone up here. I'm mad about it for like six months until finally I go to them and say, hey, you know what? You said that to me. It really hurt my feelings. And they look at me like, I had no idea. And they didn't have any idea. But for me, I'm like suffering and dying and having conversations with myself when nobody's looking. Come on, you. I know you've done it. You're having conversations in your mind. You're like going over it again. Oh, I should have said this. I should have said that. You're suffering. They don't even know. And that's what we do to punish people is we sit over here and suffer. We sit over here, I'm going to have a horrible life. That will show them. No, it's not going to show them. They don't even know. They don't even know. <laughs> it doesn't destroy the other person. It destroys us. It's like drinking the poison of unforgiveness and thinking that someone else is going to die. No, they're not going to die. You're going to die. You are the one who's going to suffer. They're not even going to know. Listen to Proverbs 18. It says, an offended brother is more unyielding 
than a fortified city. And disputes are like the barred gates of a citadel. You know why it says that? It's because when we have offense and unforgiveness in our life, it's real tough for God to get in there. It's real tough for God to minister to your heart when you've got offense and unforgiveness. That's why it says it's like the barred gates of a citadel. Because you don't let anybody in. You can't let God in. You can't let people in because you get guarded because you're harboring offense in your life. Man, it's, it's, it's a crazy subject, but I got, I got a story about this that the year was 1649. True story. A man named Oliver Cromwell wanted to overthrow the government that he was a part of. He wanted to overthrow King Charles I. You can look this up. You can Google this later. It's crazy. He wanted to overthrow that government, and he succeeded in doing so. In fact, he actually got 59 people to sign a petition to kill, to put to death King Charles I. So Oliver Cromwell succeeded in that. They put King Charles I to death, and that little coup lasted about 11 years. And he was in charge for 11 years until guess who came into power? King Charles II, his son. King Charles II rolls on the scene and says, bring me every single one of those 59 people. I want them right here before me right now. What do you think he's going to do? Okay? So his officials come back and say, man, we tried to get them all, but there's 15 of them that are already dead. And he said, that's not good enough. Go dig up their bodies and bring them before me and put them on the witness stand. Are you sure? Do it. They dug up those 15 dead bodies, put them on the witness stand and said, what do you have to say for yourself, skeleton-like? What do you have to say? Guilty. And they, okay, they hung the dead bodies from the gallows. Talk about digging up your past. Come on, somebody. Digging up those dead bodies like, like they had anything to say for yourself. And, but you know what? That's where a lot of us find ourselves these days. Stuck in one spot, digging up our past. When God's trying to move you into your future, God's trying to move you into your calling, God's trying to take you someplace that he wants you to be, that you know you're supposed to be. You've got a calling. Jeremiah 29 is like all over your life. He's got a plan for you and a purpose, a purpose and to prosper you. But you're stuck in the same spot digging up your past. Am I talking to anybody today? Don't say amen because I already know. You're stuck in one spot digging up your past. When God's saying, you got to throw down that shovel, son. you got to throw down that shovel, daughter. And quit digging up that past and quit thinking about and ruminating over and thinking over and over about that one person who hurt you that one time. It's holding you back from everything that God has called you into in your life. You've got to learn to let it go and you've got to learn to put down the shovel. Put it down. It's not doing you any good. Don't be like King Charles II. Like even their dead body, I'm going to punish them. Man, they, have, they are dead and gone. But you're a slave to it. But you're a slave to the offense. You're a slave to how they hurt you. Jesus shows us, you've got to forgive. You've got to forgive. He says this. Actually, the Bible teaches us a little bit about this. It says in Hebrews 12, 15, see to it that no one falls short of the grace of God, that no bitter root, that no bitter root grows up to cause trouble and defilement. Everybody say bitter root. Say it louder. Bitter root. You know what a bitter root is like? It's like when you, when you refuse to forgive somebody, and it's like a little weed in your backyard. It's only this big. You can get that sucker with two fingers. Bloop, comes right out. But when you let it live there for a little while, uh, anybody got any weeds like, like that are up to here in your backyard, or am I the only one that's had to deal with those? Those guys are a little bit harder to get out. The roots are a little deeper. And so you get down there, man, you just, man, I'm going to take care of this one day. And you get down there, and you grab it by the root, and you go, Ugh! Ooh, and you're like, dang. That sucker's in there. That hurt my back. That hurt my hands because it's got thorns and thistles. The longer it's been there, the harder it is to get out, and the more painful it is for everyone. And it's an eyesore, by the way. Everybody can see it. And you get that. You put the gloves on. You're like, all right, I'm going to level up here. I'm going to get this thing. I'm going to grab this thing. And you go, and the top comes off. Come on, somebody. Am I the only one? Top comes right off, and you're like, I got it. No. No, you didn't. That's when, that's when you see somebody there like, oh, I'm fine. Oh, I'm fine. I'm good. I'm fine. It's fine. No big deal. I'm fine. No good. Top comes off, but those roots, they go deeper, and they go wider, and they affect a bigger area, and it will come up again. It will come up again, even stronger than it did before. See to it that no bitter root grows down to defile 
many. I believe some people are going to be set free today from some offense and some unforgiveness that's been harboring and going down deep in your life. It's been affecting your life for far too long, and today's the day. Today's the day we're going to get over it. Today is that day. you got to pull up those weeds. Let's take a look at what could have taken root in Jesus' life. In the last 12 hours of his life, these are, these are in your notes. You can fill in these blanks right here. There's five things that Jesus had to deal with in, in the last 12 hours of life. The first one was this, betrayal. Go ahead and write that in, betrayal. He got betrayed by his main man, Judas. Now, maybe some of you have a Judas in your life, someone who was tight with you, someone you were close with, but they let you down in a serious way. Now, Jesus could have held on to that, and so can you. Very easy. Jesus dealt with that, and he's ready to show us how to face that bad day, how to face that. Number two, false accusation. Did I mention that that they paid people to go lie about Jesus in his trial? And they tried him at night, which was illegal, by the way, both in Roman culture and in Jewish culture. It wasn't even legal to try someone at night. But no, they tried him at night and then paid people, threw money at people to go and lie. Anybody had anybody say anything about you that wasn't true? Anybody? Or am I the only one? Or are pastors the only one that people like to talk smack on? Okay? Now, I'm not the only one. You're the one. It happens to you too. False accusation. Ooh, it's got to be my least favorite. False accusation. Why you got to lie about me? Jesus could have been pretty bent about that. You didn't say anything. How about this one? Rejection. And by the way, he had a lot of followers right before he got arrested. Where were they? You know, Peter was the only one that did anything, but after that, it was like they all stood at a distance. They didn't do anything. You ever felt like, man, where were you, friend? Where were you, family? Where where were you? Have you ever felt rejected? What about this one? He dealt with abuse. Now, we're going to tiptoe over some pretty sensitive subjects today. That's why I try to start it off with a little bit of funny, but this is serious stuff, okay? Talking about offense and forgiving people can be pretty serious, but let me tell you that no one faced abuse the way Jesus faced abuse. No one was abused physically, emotionally, like Jesus. Now, I've, I've done the streets thing, and I've gotten to a few fights in my day, but I never got beat beyond recognition so my own mother couldn't recognize me. I never got beat like that. Jesus got beat like that, and one thing that um, the movies and the TV shows don't display, but tradition shows us, is that when, when you were crucified, you were hung naked. Which leads me to my last thing that, that Jesus had to deal with. How about the humiliation? How about the mockery and the shame? How about getting slapped in the face? Who was that Messiah? Think you're all bad, Mr. Messiah? Who hit you that time? Strip you down naked and put you up there. What about the shame? All the things that Jesus had to deal with. This was, this was Good Friday. Really? It was his worst day ever where he said, Father, forgive them. They don't really know what they're doing. A quote from that book that I didn't mention in first service is, you know, technically every sin is a sin of ignorance. Even, even if we plan out our sin, even if we cultivate it, craft it, and like plan it all out, it's only because we don't know the gravity of what we're doing to ourselves. Every sin is a sin of ignorance. So nobody can, can, because nobody really knows the depravity of hell. And no one really knows the glory waiting for us if we can hold fast and finish the race. Every sin is a sin of ignorance. And he went through all of that. Jesus went through all of that for good reason. And it wasn't just to pay for your sins. It wasn't just to pay for your sins. Listen to this in Hebrews 2. That's why he had to enter every detail of human life. Then, when he came before God as high priest to get rid of the people's sins, he would have already experienced it all himself, all the pain, all the testing, and would be able to help where help was needed. Can I get an amen on that? Because we need help. We need help. You know, elsewhere in Hebrews, not in your notes, it talks about how how Jesus is at the right hand of the Father interceding on our behalf. You know, that's that's a legal term. That's like something a lawyer would do. A lawyer, so it's like Jesus is up there at the right hand of the Father saying, oh, Father, look at Elliot. Look at what he's going through. I've been through that, Father. Come on, let's help him out. Jesus is up there doing that for you and for me all day long. He's interceding for you. 
so that he can help us. Not just so he can pay for our sins, so that one day we'll be in heaven, so that we just put up with. No, so he can help you right here and right now. Come on, is somebody glad to hear this today? This is good news. This is the good news. There is no amount of pain and suffering that Jesus doesn't understand. So no matter what you pray, God says, I understand, and I'm going to help you. And I'm going to help you. Man, that's good. It says help needed because you're not going to feel like forgiving people. If, if lesson number one is to forgive people, we need to look at things the way Jesus was looking at it. And, you know, forgiveness starts here, not here. It's, it's here, not here. Like when my kids want to clean the toilet with my toothbrush without me knowing about it, I don't feel like forgiving that. I feel like brushing their own teeth with it. I'm not going to do that. I promise I didn't do that. <laughs> but I know I need to forgive them because they don't know what they're doing. We need to know. We need to have the same kind of thinking Christ had. It wasn't that Jesus felt like forgiving them. He knew he needed to. Listen to this scripture. This is powerful in 1 Peter chapter 4. Since Christ suffered while he was in his body, strengthen yourselves with the same way of feeling? Is that what it says? No, with the same way of thinking. And he thought and said, Father, forgive them because they don't know what they're doing. That's the way Christ thought. Strengthen yourself with the same way that Christ thought to be able to forgive those who have offended you. Now, I need to clarify some things about forgiveness because some of you might run off and, and, and think that I'm, I'm suggesting things about forgiveness that just aren't true. So listen to me. This is very important. There are a couple things I need to tell you that forgiveness is not. Forgiveness is not minimizing the seriousness of the offense. Jesus did not sit on the cross and say, oh, yeah, it, it's okay. No, no, it wasn't okay. And what happened to you and what they did to you was not okay. Forgiveness is not about saying, oh, it's fine. Oh, it's okay. No, it wasn't okay. Forgiveness is not minimizing the seriousness of the offense. That's first. Number two, forgiveness is not reconciliation because reconciliation takes two. Reconciliation means that the two people involved have come back together again and like husband and wife were separated, but now they're reconciled, they're back together again. Forgiveness does not depend on reconciliation because think about it, if it was, then you would be holding yourself hostage to the person who offended you. When you forgive someone, it does not necessarily mean that you're going to be best friends again that you will ever be friends again, that you will ever speak to each other again, that that person will ever come around and be nice again, that person will, will say sorry. You've, you've probably heard it that forgiveness isn't, isn't saying I forgive you after someone says sorry. Well, that's more true than a lot of people realize. No one needs to say sorry for you for you to forgive them. Forgiveness is not reconciliation. Listen to this next one. Forgiveness is not about doing what's fair. Because if you want to play the fair game, then you have to pay for every sin you ever committed. And I don't know about you, that's a check I can't write. That's a bill I can't pay. When it comes to forgiving someone, I can't, it's not about fair. C.S. Lewis said it like this. This is an amazing quote by a, an amazing man. C.S. Lewis said, to be a Christian means to forgive the inexcusable. The inexcusable. It's unexcusable, but I will forgive it because God has forgiven the inexcusable in me. Because I know how deprived I am. I know how much I've lied. I know how much I've cheated. I know how much I've stolen. I know all the wrongs I've done in my life that no one else knows about. I can't pay for all that. In fact, the Bible says that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. So even if you feel like, well, I'm better than that sucker. <laughs> well, maybe you are in your own eyes, but who are you comparing yourself to? You could compare yourself to them or you compare yourself to Christ. Because compared to Christ, we all fall short. So we need to learn that it's not, it's not about playing the fair game. It's not about doing what's fair for them. But this last one's important too. Forgiveness is not impossible. It's not impossible. You can do it. You can absolutely do it. You can let go of that offense. You can forgive that person. Because we know that Philippians 4.13 says that I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. And I know the scripture was originally about money, but I don't think he would have written it the way he wrote it if he didn't want us to apply it to different areas of our life. 
I can do this through Christ who gives me strength. Christ can give me the strength to forgive someone who has done me absolutely wrong. And I've got a few of them. I've got a few people on my list. I don't know about you. But I got some people that did me absolutely wrong. But I have to forgive them if I want to live a productive and fruitful life and not live every day like the worst day of my life. Sitting over here suffering like I'm punishing them. No, I want to get free from that. I don't know about you. I want to get free from that. So things are about to get practical here and things are about to get difficult. Because these application steps I'm going to give you, I'm telling you right now from the bottom of my heart, they ain't easy. (laughs) This ain't designed to be easy. It's designed to be life-changing for you. It's designed to set you free. It's designed for you to finally be free from those bitter roots that may have been taken hold. Listen to this. The strength comes from detaching from the person and the situation and trusting in the sovereignty of God and saying, God, if you can do it and you made me in your image, I'm going to do it through your strength. I'm going to be able to do this. And you won't believe some of these things until you try them. So I encourage you, try these, these three things I'm about to tell you. Just give, them, just give them a chance. Just give them a chance. Number one, this is the first thing I want you to write in. I want you to apply to your life to anyone who's ever hurt you, anyone who's ever offended you. you got to pray for them. Number one, pray for them. Pray, and don't pray they get hit by an 18-wheeler. Not that kind of prayer. I know what y'all are thinking. I know what kind of church I'm in. Like, I pray that God would smite them with, a th- with the fleas of a thousand camels. You know, like, nah, not none of those prayers, all right? Not like that. Like, really pray for them. Because it's hard to hate somebody you're praying for. It's hard to stay bitter towards someone that you're praying for. I hope somebody's hearing me in this place today. Listen to Matthew 5. You have heard it was said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you, this is Jesus talking to us. Love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you or have persecuted you. And listen, their life may not change. When you're praying for that person, nothing may change in their life. But I guarantee you, your life will change. Your life will change. This is not a message for them. I'm not preaching a message to somebody who's not here today. I'm not preaching a message to the person who hurt you. I'm preaching a message to you. Because you praying for them may not change their life, but it will definitely change yours. I've seen this in counseling situations where I'm counseling with like a husband or a wife. And I've, se- I've seen it happen where they're, they're fighting, you know, they're really mad at each other. And, you're like, and you just start things off. You know, this is a little tip for anybody who's in a situation like that. Hey, would you mind just praying for her? And they don't want to. Because it's, you, can't be, you can't hang on to that hatred. You can't hang on to that anger when you start praying for them. You can start mad, but you just watch it happen. Father, I just, you know, you pray for them. I pray that you would, you know, help them. And you just watch things start. Because when you pray for someone, it changes your eyes for them. You start to get God's heart for them. You start to get God's eyes for them. Because you're in communication with God. And you start to get God's heart for them and not your own. And it, it, it goes away with the flesh. And it begins, your spirit starts, oh, it's, just try it. Uh, that's all I'm saying is try it. Pray for them. Pray for them. Here's number two. You need to bless them. I'm talking about the person who hurts you, mind you. Bless them. And the origin of that word, bless, is verbal. It means to speak positive, to speak blessing. Curse, too, to speak curses. But to bless them means to speak well of. Speak well of them. Luke 6 says this. But I tell you who hear me, love your enemies, do good to those who hate you, bless, speak well of, those who curse, speak poorly of, you. Speak well of those who speak poorly of you. I didn't say this was going to be easy. (laughs) I just said it was the answer. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who mistreat you. Romans 12 says, bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Even if the curse that you want to say is more true than the blessing. Come on, somebody. You know, you got a thousand real things, real curses that you could say, but you're like hunting for one nice thing to say. I've seen this in action. I've heard a story about this. A youth pastor who, who was a great youth pastor, had a great group, a big old youth group. And, and, you know, there was this one girl who kept coming to his group for like two years. And she would sit in the very back, come like two hours early, sit in the back every single week, sit in the back, go just like this. You know, the, anybody got any kids like that? You know what I mean? Like, just wait. Give them a couple years. You know, just the whole attitude, the whole deal. And the whole time he's preaching, people are getting saved, they're having awesome worship, and this girl is in the back for two years. 
And he's trying to preach, and some of you look like that. And I'm trying to preach through that. You know, you're like, <gasps> and I'm like, just trying to do something. I'm, I'm speaking blessing about you right now. Um, blessing. But, you know, he had enough. This youth pastor had enough and was like, you know what? I'm going to tell this girl where to go, and it's not to my youth group. I'm going to tell this girl where to go because I'm just sick of it. She's, like, coming in, bringing all of her sass and her bad attitude, and he's walking up to her. He's all mad. He's like, I'm going to come up to her, and the Holy Spirit says, you better stop it right there. You better stop it right Don't you dare. This is what the man said. This is what the youth pastor said. He said, the Holy Spirit told him, don't you dare say that to her. And he walks up to her, and the Holy Spirit says that to him, and he stops, and he looks at her and says, you know what I love about you? <laughs> and he like, he doesn't even know what he's about to say, you know, because that wasn't the plan at all. You know what I love about you? And he says, you are the most consistent person in this entire group. <laughs> he ain't lying. He said, he said, you're the most consistent person in this whole group. And you know what? That is a fantastic quality to have. You're so consistent. God bless you. And, and you, as he tells the story, you could just, like, she's like, really? She knows what she was doing. And he would come up and say that after all this time. And she, the story goes, she gave her heart to Christ that night, and she became the most powerful person in that youth group because he chose to speak blessing instead of cursing, even though the curse was absolutely 100% true. He could have said a lot of true things, but that's not what the Bible says to do. Bless those who persecute you, even though they're dirtbags. Say good things because you never know, and it's not for them it's for you. This is going to bless your life. Listen to this last one, but this last one is crazy talk, crazy talk, but you can do this. For the person who offended you, the person who hurt you, you need to do good to them. Do good to them. The whole nother level because it's one thing to pray for somebody. It's another thing to say nice things, but it's another thing to actually put your hands on something and do something good for them. This is, this is absolutely crazy, and this is where the scripture talks about it in Romans 12. Do not repay anyone evil for evil. Be careful to do what is right. You know, it doesn't say bless because that's verbal. It says do good. Do something. Do what is right in the eyes of everybody. If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Do not take revenge, my friends, but leave room for God's wrath. Hey, if, if something bad is going to happen to them, let God do it, not you. That's what the Bible says. Leave room for God to do it. If it's going to happen, let God do it. If not, you ain't doing it. Don't you do evil on them. That is not what I'm commanding you, my son, my daughter, to do. Don't you do evil on them. Instead, on the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. Oh, man, I don't, that is not what I want to hear. <laughs> feed him. If he's thirsty, give him something to drink. In doing this, you will heap burning coals on his head, but wait. A lot of people think, oh, finally, yeah, he burning coals on his head. Yeah, let's preach it, pastor. Yeah, now, amen. What was that? No, 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 no. Back when this was written, burning coals were a commodity. They didn't have propane and propane accessories back when this was written. They had burning coals. They couldn't cook their food without it. Yes, it may have come, came to them in a way that scorched them a little bit, but they needed that. If your coals went out, you couldn't cook your food, and you're eating raw meat. You needed burn, even that, when people think, oh, yeah, burning coals on their head, that's a commodity too. That's actually doing good for them. It may have brushed them, you know, it may have scarred them a little bit. But listen to this, this next part of this verse, somebody needs to underline it, highlight it, and this is for somebody, and it's a life verse for somebody to get you out of the place that you've been living in for so long. Listen to this. Do not overcome evil by evil, but overcome evil with good. Do not overcome evil with evil, but overcome evil with good. This is a whole nother level. And one of the most powerful um, stories that I've heard on this subject, um, putting this principle into, into practice, was uh, from a, a, a lady named Joyce Meyer. And whenever heard of Joyce Meyer, she's pretty famous. A lot of people heard of her, and she's really fantastic. Actually, Joyce Meyer's pastor was here speaking two nights ago. I, I didn't know about it either, so don't feel bad. Tommy Barnett, who is the founder of the Dream Center, the kind of the, the ministry we want to do in the future and start the, uh, start the recovery center, he was here speaking on this platform just two nights ago. It was amazing. But Joyce Meyer, 
um, told a story at a uh, conference in Australia. This was about five years ago. This was about five years ago. And she began by saying, I'm about to tell a story I've never told before. And when someone like Joyce Meyer says that, who's written that many books and done that many things in her life, when she's about to tell, tell a, a, a room full of people something they've never told before, obviously they had all had, you know, she had their attention. It was right away. And she proceeded to tell them how she had been raped by her father. And then she said the exact number of times. And it was over 200 times. And the air just got sucked out of the room. And she knew, she knew every single instance, she goes on to say, because each event was so vivid and so painful that she remembers exactly. She can remember every time. Every time. And so the horror kind of set in just because for that to happen to somebody. But for that to happen to somebody by their own father, and that many times, it's just horrific. It's horrific. But she, Joyce Meyer, she years later became who she was, the powerhouse speaker, the powerful woman of God that we all know and love. And she was confronted with this principle. Do good to those who persecute you. She said, well, I guess I will. And she proceeded, she's amazingly wealthy now, you know, she's amazingly blessed. And so she blessed both of her parents because not, it's not, if, if that's something like that happens to you, it's not just the one parent, it's both. Because one person did something and the other person did nothing. And so it's, she went ahead and blessed both of them. And she took care of every bill they ever had. She paid off their cars, she paid off, she paid for their insurance. At no bill, they had no more money issues at all. She's like, nope, everything's all covered, I'm going to take care of everything. And not only that, but the Holy Spirit led her to build them a house right next to hers so that her parents could live right next to her. And the whole time, there was never a, I'm sorry. The whole time, there was never a, I'm proud of you. They, they weren't saved. They didn't believe in God. The whole time, there was no reconciliation. There was no kindness. There was no forgiveness. There was no nothing. But she did it anyways, all the way to their old age. All the way till the day they died, really. But before that, before her father passed away, he came to her in his, in his elderly state. I mean, really old, could barely walk around, and came to her. He lived right next door. He, he walked over there, and he was crying. And he said, honey, I don't know what's going on, but I, I just have to tell you that I'm so sorry for what I did to you. I'm so sorry for how I hurt you. And I want to hear more about this Jesus you know. He gives his life to Christ. Joyce Meyer baptizes her own father just shortly before he dies. And he goes to heaven instead of hell, by the way. Come on, is anybody hearing this? Is anybody, is anybody getting this, the gravity of this, how powerful this can be? And some, somebody might say, man, that's a power, that, that must have been difficult. Or that must have been hard for her. But you know what? You know what Joyce Meyer goes on to say? She said, and I'm not sorry it happened. I'm not sorry anymore. I'm not sorry it happened anymore. Why? Because I got to experience what my Savior went through. When he forgave everyone's sins all at once, I got to feel the power of God working in me. And I'm not sorry it happened. Because I can experience that. And now because of that, my my daddy, she calls, she calls him her daddy. My daddy's in heaven because of that. Come on, somebody. This is, I, I, know, I know I'm venturing into pretty dangerous territory here, but we, we've got to hear this. I know I may be talking about some things that maybe you haven't tried to think about in a long time. Stuff you've tried to forget about. Let me tell you, forgetting about it is not going to help. Forgetting about it is not going to bless anyone or you. Forgetting about it is not the answer. And let me tell you, there's no one who's been abused like, like Jesus himself. And he knows, he understands, and he can help you. He can help you with this. How can we do this? How can we do all this? This, is, this seems so difficult, but how can we do this? I'll tell you how we can do this. By Matthew 10, verse 8. Freely you have received, freely give. Freely you have received, freely give. The reason why we can even bring ourselves to do this, the reason why we can do this, the reason why I can do this is because I've experienced that myself. Because Jesus has forgiven me. I'll never have to forgive anyone 
more than Jesus has forgiven me. And you will never have to forgive anyone more than Jesus has forgiven you. This is the last piece of note that I'm going to give you. And this is really the crux of the message. The forgiven forgive. We forgive because we have been forgiven. And we forgive much because Jesus has forgiven us much. In closing, I just want to tell you a story that, that Jesus told. He said there was, there was two people that were forgiven a debt. One was forgiven a debt of 500. The other was forgiven a debt of 500. Who do you think loved the person who forgave the debt more? The person who was forgiven more. That's exactly right. The more we've been forgiven, the more we are able to forgive. So I think right now in this time, in this atmosphere, it's a time to ask for forgiveness. It's a time to really receive forgiveness because when we receive forgiveness, we can extend it. I want you to bow your heads and close your eyes with me. I know this is a very sensitive uh, moment, so please let's try and be respectful to the people sitting next to you by being extra quiet and just being sensitive to what the Holy Spirit wants to speak. Some of us are dealing with some serious things right now, so I just want to give an opportunity for everyone to hear the voice of the Holy Spirit. Let's just ask God. God, what are you trying to show me? What are you trying to say to me? Who would you have me forgive? Who have I been holding on to offense? What kind of offense have I been holding on to? Just let God speak to you right now in this quiet moment. God, thank you for forgiving us so much. And I know there may be some of us here that haven't yet received that forgiveness or Maybe we have received the forgiveness, but we've just drifted from God and want to come home to Him. I want to give an opportunity to every single person in this house to receive the free gift of salvation, receive the free gift of forgiveness. And no matter what side of the offense we're on, we're all sinners. We all fall short of the glory of God. And the forgiven forgive. So if that's you today, if if there's anyone here that, would, that wants to have forgiveness for all their sins, that wants to give their life to Jesus once and for all, and if there's anyone here who wants to give their life back to Jesus, you've been walking with him in the past, but something happened where you grew distant or your heart grew cold to him, and you're ready to come home to him and say, God, I'm giving my life back to you. If that's you today, I want you to go ahead and just lift your hand up to the sky. Nobody looking around. I want to pray a prayer for you. If that's you, just go ahead and lift your hand right now and say, include me in that prayer, Pastor. Go ahead. Amen, I see your hand. Amen, I see your hand. Amen, I see your hand. These are salvations, people. Amen. And God sees you. He sees your heart. He sees what you're going through. He not only understands, but he is going to meet you in this spot right now. So come on, if if that's you, I want you to pray this prayer. If you believe it in your heart, I want you to pray this prayer after me. Go ahead and do it nice and bold. And if you believe it, say it with me. Say, Father God, I give my life to you. Forgive me of my sins and make me whole. Fill me with your spirit and lead me in the way you would have me go. Help me to forgive the way you've forgiven me. I give you my life. Amen. Can we clap our hands for everybody who gave their life to Jesus?